I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. Dance, music, and photography. What's their link to science? You'll be surprised. Science and You starts now. I'm Mike Gilliam at Grand Central Terminal. A lot of superheroes have come through here. But before a superhero is ever on the movie screen or on the pages of a comic book, it starts in someone's imagination. But that imagination is not allowed to run wild. They have to get the science correct. We're going to show you how in just a second on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover here at the Mysterious Bookshop. What does science have to do with a mystery writer? We're on the case, ahead on Science and You. I'm Andrew Falzone. Treating the side effects of cancer can involve some very complex medicine, but for one groundbreaking program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, all patients need is a pen, paper, and willingness to write about their experience. That story is coming up on Science and You. I'm Tina Vespina. More doctors are prescribing music along with medication. The reason why? Ahead on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. The vivid colors of an art exhibition combined with the sounds of frogs, dozens of them. Join us for our tour of Frogs, a chorus of colors, ahead on Science and You. I'm Dr. Max Gomez. I'll show you beauty and art in that tiny world you'll never see. Straight ahead on Science and You. I'm Mike Gilliam. When you watch a superhero on the big screen, many of the plots seem believable. In fact, a lot of the things that you see in those science fiction movies end up coming true many years later. But how do they get it right? Well, they go to a guy like this man. His name is Dr. Kevin Grazier, and he has a PhD in planetary physics. He's the type of guy that helps a Spider-Man snare you in his web, allows Wolverine to draw you in, and makes Batman the true caped crusader. He's worked on Battlestar Galactica, Eureka, and The Event. And he says producers try to get the science right. Hollywood producers want to ground their series in accurate science. You want to create more moments that make the viewer say, wow, and fewer that make them say, oh, please. Because when you make a viewer say, oh, please, with bad science, they transform from someone who's immersed in your creative vision to someone who's sitting among four walls in the 21st century feeling cheated like they could have done that much better. Grazier says it's not so much that the science has to be accurate as to feel accurate so that the viewer says, wow, that could happen. And if you've done all of your homework along the way, the audience is much more likely to take a leap with you later. So what about Spider-Man? Spider-Man, one of my favorites, uh, bitten by a radioactive spider. You notice that over the years, from the 60s to the more recent incarnations, as we've learned more about DNA, the, the story behind the, the spider has actually changed. So, there, so the, the creators of the more recent Spider-Man and then the reboot, the, the new new Spider-Man, ha have done their homework and, and attempted to, to incorporate newer science in the creation of Peter Parker. How about the Hulk? Dr. Banner was, was irradiated with gamma rays. Now, let's go back into the 50s and 60s. It was always radiation. Radiation could do anything. Batman is a different story. Batman is really just a high-tech driven superhero. I mean, yeah, he's in great shape, and yes, he knows how to fight, and, and et cetera, and, and so yes, he's a martial artist, uh, both internally and with the, 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 the skill, but really it's his tech. He has a whole huge, you know, Wayne Enterprise is supporting him. So in that case, the science creates the superhero in many respects. How do you make sure that that is believable from a scientific standpoint? So you could start from the beginning, you could incorporate science before you even start writing, or at the very end when the screenplay is written, you hand it to someone who red pens it and say, well, no, you, that this could be improved, this could be improved, this doesn't happen, but maybe this, this could, et cetera. Now, do you ever have a situation where you're doing that, you're red penning something, and a guy says, oh, wait a minute, my creative vision is here, and this is the storyline. I can't let the science get in the way. Story wins every time. 
the science advisor, if, if the science doesn't work, it's incumbent upon a science person to find something that does. If this science doesn't work, hey, maybe this does. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a give and take process. We're sitting here in Grand Central. They're about to celebrate their centennial. What is the one superhero movie that stands out in your mind that took place here? One of my favorites, one that kind of flew under the superhero radar, in my opinion, Unbreakable. Bruce Willis, um, awesome performance. Uh, I think kind of flew under the radar because people expected it to be Sixth Sense Part Two, but Bruce Willis literally stood right here and you know, in a very iconic moment, in my opinion, holding on his hands, touching people, as uh, sensing their life story as they brush past. Fantastic movie, fantastic place. Again, one of, one of my favorites. But when it comes to what movie did the best job of using science to make a superhero seem believable, Grazier says one stands out. Wolverine. Wolverine, um, his claws, his adamantium skeleton, that's not a superpower. That's a side effect of his superpower. He has incredible healing properties, or had incredible ability to heal, which allowed him to survive the process. So his, his fighting skill comes from technology, but it was his, his healing ability that allowed him to survive that. I think that's the most believable of the of superheroes in, in my mind. Bottom line, um, how important is the science to the superhero genre? Marginally important. Um, people who watch these superhero movies um, don't expect super accurate science. I believe they like it when you've made the attempt to ground your story in accurate science. If you tell a plausible backstory, they'll go with you on the journey when you're, you've pushed a little bit more into the, in the more fantastic elements. So you get that? The science is important, but only to draw you into the fantasy. I'm Mike Gilliam for Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. Just who is the mysterious alias behind the novels by Ada Madison and Margaret Grace? For a scientist or a sleuth, the answer is, of course, elementary. I'm Camille Minichino. I'm a teacher, a physicist, a laser physicist, a human factors engineer, a curriculum developer, a mystery writer. For all her occupations over the years, she's best known now as a mystery writer under various pen names. And her books are often set within the worlds of science and academia, with titles like The Hydrogen Murder, The Carbon Murder, The Square Root of Murder, and The Probability of Murder. Well, the ivory tower or academic mystery is, I, I, is experiencing a little uh, renaissance and becoming popular. And I think one of the reasons is that the ivory tower, just as it sounds, is supposed to be this wonderful, peaceful place with people walking around with lofty ideas, having conversations about philosophy and the Socratic method, and nothing bad really happens except maybe the food in the cafeteria isn't that great. So when you take that sort of idyllic setting of a school, a campus especially, beautiful campus, a tower, a bell tower, and then you look inside and you see all of this there's pettiness and things go wrong and people don't like each other and actually a murder. There's a saying people use that you should write what you know. Camille Minichino follows that adage. Having been immersed in the scientific community since the late 60s in everything from nuclear power and physics to lasers. Three Mile Island happened in uh, the late 70s. So immediately there was a huge rush in this country to look at all the nuclear power plants and see what was wrong with them or right with them. So I worked um, on control room design. I went to the laboratory in Livermore, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I spent a number of years in high temperature physics. This time to melt heavy metal, I worked with one of the very few, or the very original uh, helium neon mixtures, a, you know, a gas laser. And now, of course, you can take peanut butter and get it to laze. So I've been really lucky to be able to see the whole history of lasers and to work with one of the early ones. That influence is proudly front and center in her novels, whether it's the puzzles in the back of the books or the scientific imagery in her prose. A love of writing and a love of science in a way I don't see them that different. So my metaphors tend to be based on physics and math as opposed to flowers and pets. Uh, so I would never say something like, uh, it, you know, being quiet as a mouse. 
I would say, just as quiet as the inside of a vacuum tube. If you're going to be a scientist, you better know how to read and write also. If you're going to be a writer or a poet, you better know some science and math also. For Camille, they're all just different perspectives for understanding the world around us. One of the things I love to do is model making, and I do it in many ways. I do physics, I do fiction, and I make models. What it is, it helps us understand the universe. The universe behaves as if there were atoms. And it's the same with a, a novel. When we read a novel, uh, it's not real. We see it help, but it does help us understand real situations. But when we read the book, we gain an understanding of murder even when we're writing crime fiction, which is my main focus right now. We gain an understanding of what crime is like in the real world, how it affects people, including the detectives who try to solve it. But of all her talents, what gives her perhaps her biggest thrill is connecting with readers to make science fun and accessible. I wish I had someone, something like this when I was taking science or taking math. And that's my favorite reader. I'm not really sure what could be more fun than science. I lean toward math and science, the quantitative way of looking at the world. Um, and the rest of it, to me, is what makes the world beautiful. For Camille Minichino, science and literature have perfect chemistry. No mystery about that. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Andrew Falzone. Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is known for its groundbreaking research and innovative ways of treating and even curing some forms of cancer. The hospital is also known for finding new and alternative therapies to help relieve the huge amount of stress associated with cancer treatment. In 2008, the hospital started a first-of-its-kind program called Visible Inc. The program pairs patients with a writing professional, while the hospital's doctors focus on treating a patient's body. Visible Inc. focuses on treating a patient's spirit. I tell them there's one rule. You need to enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, you need to let me know so that we can fix it and you'll enjoy it more. Judith Kelman is a published novelist with more than two million copies of her psychological thrillers in print. When she started Visible Inc. five years ago, she wasn't sure if cancer patients would want to write about their illness. If they don't wish to write about cancer because they're living it, okay, enough of that, they can write rap lyrics, blogs, screenplays, stage plays, comedy sketches, fiction, poetry, anything. And because we have, at this point, 54 terrific volunteers from all areas of writing, we can pair them with an expert. Any of Sloan Kettering's patients can enroll in the program. Each patient is paired with a mentor who's a professional writer, but the real focus is on Visible Ink participants like Barbara pass. Schachter. Surprise is hardly the word. Stunned, shocked. Barbara has been a Visible Ink participant yeah. since yeah. 2009. Her worsening condition and chemotherapy treatments led to frequent visits and occasional overnight stays at Sloan. It was during one of those stays when another patient in her room introduced her to Visible Ink. I came home and the phone rang. It was a woman introduced herself who told me that she had been an editor at Time and Life magazines for 26 years, heard that I was a writer, and would I be interested in working with them at the... I said, sure. 15 minutes later, the woman knocked at my door. <laughs> Talk about rapid response. Talk about rapid response, yes. And over the years, that rapid response led to a rapid rapport between mentor and mentee. We're girlfriends and lunch friends, but I always show her my stuff before I submit it. But that's more for a, a pat on the back that you get from a good friend, you know. For Barbara, writing has been a serene escape from a rare disease that now requires a demanding chemotherapy regimen that leaves her drained. Each year, her writing has been submitted and published in Visible Inc.'s annual anthology. Not only does the anthology showcase the best writing from the program, along with grants and donations, it also helps fund the program. I didn't want to burden patients with another bill, with another cost. And so we went about this saying, you know, we need to figure out how to fund this. 
and the annual anthology provides more than funding for the program, it also serves as source material for Visible Inc.'s annual staged reading, which brings together patients writing with Broadway and broadcast actors who bring the written word to life. I felt physically exhausted. I could not focus on the simplest task. Some of the staged reading work is so well received, it gets produced in some other form, like Barbara Schachter's poem, The East River, which now resides on YouTube. Hungry for the East River. Not a river at all, really, but a tidal strait of unbridled energy. For Barbara, seeing her work come to life as part of the program has given her new life, even as a patient with a terminal disease. You have such a rare disease. You were on the cutting edge of medicine with your stem cell transplant. Yes. But something tells me that Visible Ink has been a, a medicine that has been even more powerful. It has absolutely. A medicine is a good way to describe it. It's a wonderful program. God bless her for thinking of it. God bless them for implementing it. But. I can't begin to quantify how many people it has made feel like you're alive again. In order to participate in Visible Inc., you have to be a patient at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You. I'm Tina Beth Pena. Advances in technology have allowed doctors to do amazing things to help their patients recover from injuries and illnesses. But more and more, those same doctors are finding that a simple tune can have a powerful impact on a person's health. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Paul Battelle suffered a stroke over a year and a half ago and lost his ability to speak. But he found his voice again through music therapy. When I came, I wasn't able to talk that much, but I have improved a lot. I'm about 90% much better compared to when I first came in. When one specific area of the brain is severely damaged, a key element of that function could be lost. But what we know is that there's other networks that also serve that particular function that can be stimulated to regain, help regain as much of that function as possible, something called neuroplasticity and also compensation. So many times our patients who've lost function on the left side of the brain for speech, regain it over time where the right side of the brain starts taking over some of the speech function. Music therapy is both an art and a science that taps into the musical side of our brains, helping patients restore, improve, or maintain their mental and physical health. Music seems to serve as a gentle ease, as a way of transition, as a means of integration, integrating the breath, the heart, the cognitive firing of neurons. Um, music is key in bridging all these systems together. This is more than just an anecdote. This is actually something where we can measure and prove and build evidence for ways to treat. Former Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords credits music therapy for playing an essential role in her recovery after a gunshot wound to the head left her unable to speak. According to Dr. Lowy, singing can help brain injury patients learn how to speak again. I had read that her first words coming back with language were the song, Girls Just Wanna Have Fun. So I think probably music is imprinted as a healing for her. And as a music psychotherapist, I took that as that's what she's chewing on. And I think that our uh, neural capacity, our neurologic function is enhanced by what we chew on musically, particularly people who have had strokes or people who have had brain damage. Music therapy can also help patients with several other diagnoses, from asthma to Alzheimer's and many other things in between. At different stages of different illnesses, music therapy has a role. So it can have a preventive role early on, 
or immediately after, um, say if somebody had a stroke and the music therapy can help immediately after for recovery. Music therapy has also shown to offer other benefits, such as lowering blood pressure, boosting immunity, and easing muscle tension. Science is validating what many have suspected for years. Music can be magic, and when integrated with medicine, may be able to hit all the right notes. We're growing the science of music medicine and music therapy. Um, as doctors and nurses invite us to come into settings like the operating room, they see that the music in a quick moment can change. Not only the patient's desire to stay in the bed or a patient's capacity to work with their pain, we get results. We change breathing, we change heart rates, and we impact the outlook of the way a person perceives and changes their meds or changes the way they think. It's all the center in the brain, and music locks into those neural pathways in a way that we're only beginning to understand. The healing power of music can have a dramatic impact on premature babies as well, who have a lifetime ahead of them. A new study finds that playing womb-like music or lullabies will not only soothe the baby and their parents, but can also improve their eating and sleeping patterns while increasing opportunities for parent and child bonding. For Science and You, I'm Tina Beth Pina. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Many of us would think of frogs as being green or brown or somewhere in between, but in fact, frogs come in many colors, some as vivid as what you'd see in a painting. Today, we take you inside an exhibition where nature's artwork is on full display. Step inside this exhibition, and the first thing you're struck by is the color of the frogs. Intense, unexpected, and startling color. The best thing of all is uh, you get these sometimes spectacular bright colors. I mean, who would think you'd get a blue frog, uh, for example, or a frog with bright red eyes? Incredibly surprising. Exactly. Just like you think about, say, uh, wasps being yellow and black, you know, that's a warning sign, uh, stay away. Uh, so these frogs that are really toxic, uh, uh, they develop bright colors as a warning sign to potential predators uh, uh, to, to avoid. Uh, now we have a lot of frogs that are also toxic that don't have those bright colors. Christopher Raxworthy is the lead curator of Frogs, a Chorus of Colors at the American Museum of Natural History. As you'd probably guess, he's partial to frogs, but even a novice can see the beauty here, though beauty is not necessarily a first association with these amphibians. Even if you like look into the, like, the ugliest toad, I mean, they have those beautiful colored eyes. So uh, I think that there's beauty about uh, these animals. Uh, the dart poison frogs are perhaps the most striking and aptly named. Well, they got the name uh, poison dart frog because uh, uh, indigenous people where they occur uh, discovered that with the most toxic frogs that they could actually take the toxins and tip darts, which they then put into uh, blow guns, which they use for hunting. What would happen in the wild if you touched that? yellow frog? Well, the, the toxins uh, would actually uh, get into your skin and uh, um, you can get a sort of a numbing sensation and if you get enough of it, it will actually uh, paralyze you and, uh, and then kill you. Not a frog you'd want to kiss? No. No risk of that here, however. These frogs bred in captivity have a diet free of the toxins they eat in the wild, where their bright color sends an important message. All that vivid color is basically saying to predators, yep. don't eat me. Yep, yep, back off, yeah. With this fellow, beauty may be a tough sell, but the African bullfrog is African fascinating bullfrog. and huge, with a taste for mice, as we saw in this video. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Still, the African bullfrog looks dainty compared to the Goliath frog. The skeleton here gives you a sense of its size. You see where the eyes go? There's no bone underneath the eyes, and that's because they use their eyeballs to actually help them swallow. When a frog swallows, they pull their eyes in and they push the eyes down, and they help to push the food down into the gut. Beyond the color, the size, and the eating habits of some frogs, what's also surprising is how varied they are, vastly different than the mental picture many of us would conjure up. But the curator here explains for some species, extinction is a real threat. So there are a few species of frogs which have actually gone extinct recently for various reasons, either loss of habitat or uh, a disease, there's a fungal disease which is now attacking them. Once something's gone, it's really gone, it's irreversible. And uh, that diversity of life, I mean, uh, to me, 
that's the kind of world that I want to raise my kids in, to see really cool frogs and all this amazing wildlife. And so anytime we lose a species, I feel like uh, uh, we're sort of lessening the, uh, uh, the richness of the environment that we live in. The frogs at the museum represent about 25 species from around the world, but scientists here explain these amphibians are even more diverse than that. More than 6,000 species of frogs have been counted. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Dr. Max Gomez. Have you ever looked at a waterfall, a mountainside, a flower, and marveled at the beauty of nature? Well, that beauty doesn't just exist in things you can see with the naked eye. It also exists at the tiny microscopic level. These are brain cells. This is scar tissue. Let me show you beauty and art through a microscope. At first, they look a little like computer-generated images or something from a horror movie, maybe abstract art from an artist's fevered imagination. But these are pictures of a world few of us ever see, photographs taken through a microscope of tiny structures, some living, some fossilized, some minerals, but all are real. They actually exist in nature. The photos are all winning entries in the Nikon Small World Competition, an annual contest for images captured through a microscope. It's a competition that we really feel is sort of interfacing art and science. Um, it allows the general public to sort of get a glimpse into scientific or research imaging uh, in, the, in the microscope and really see some of the beauty and aesthetics of it. You don't have to be a scientist to appreciate the beauty in the eye organ of a fruit fly larvae, the blood-brain barrier in a live zebrafish embryo, or of human bone cancer. They're mesmerizing in their delicacy. And the colors are real. They're generated in a variety of ways. We get um, contrasting in color both with stains as well as uh, genetically modified organisms, for example, that express colors to allow scientists to see them better. Um, so we, we run that range and then looking at certain things uh, under different conditions, such as polarized light, it brings out colors based on the material properties themselves. Just as fascinating are the images from unexpected sources, like dried soy sauce, melted sulfur crystals, a mineral that looks more like a sea anemone, the heart of a malaria mosquito, and the organs of smell in a zebrafish. The images are as varied as nature itself. Nikon has collected thousands of them in the 39 years a contest has been running. It makes an entertaining tour on their website, nikonsmallworld.com. We want to get kids excited about science, to try and stimulate young people to get excited about science, and hopefully to go into the scientific disciplines. So you see, beauty really is all around us, and science and art aren't that far apart. I'm Dr. Max Gomez for Science and You. That's our show for today. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. We'll see you next time on Science and You.